the past 12 months have been an amazing time in the life of my brother. And it's hard to believe that that same brother used to call home on the first night of 4-H camp uh, begging to be brought home early. That same brother has spent almost every night of the year away from home and almost never calls home crying to be brought back. So uh, he's done some really great things. He's had an awesome time this year. And uh, even though he's been to all these great places and done all these cool things, whenever he comes home, the only thing that he wants to talk about is you guys. When he looks back at his national officer year, what he'll remember is the connections he's made with you. Getting to know you, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> getting to know you has made his year amazing, and we're very excited to share him with you one last time this morning. Uh, please welcome to the stage my brother and your national FFA secretary, Mitch Baker, as he delivers his retiring address at the table. If there are two things in this world that I love, it's got to be drinking coffee and spending time with my family. How awesome is coffee, right? Coffee picks you up, calms you down. It's the lifeblood that drives the dreams of champions. But what I love drinking way more than coffee is spending time with my family. We are, have, my family is pretty neat and we have some really fun conversations about music and life filled with Saturday Night Live one-liners and random movie quotes, but they're really cool all the same. You know, when I think about it, I think my favorite thing to do is to eat with my family. It only takes us 30 minutes to eat, but we'll easily spend two hours sitting around the table, catching each other up on life and drinking coffee. Some of my happiest times have come from sitting in a chair just like this, eating and drinking coffee with my family. Like the one time that I came to the dinner table after coming home from a trip, and my sister Abby, who y'all just saw, was right in the middle of explaining how she found her old jacket and was able to manage to fit the dog inside of it, and then showed us this picture. And then proceeded to tell us how she, the dog ran around the entire neighborhood showing off his new biker swag to all the neighbors. You see, perfect example of the stuff that happens at my family's table all the time. When my family's at the table, they always feel really open to sharing what's going on in their lives, to opening up about what's going on at a really deep level. And as a result, we always come away a little wiser, knowing what's going on in each other's lives. Today, just like at my family's table, I'd like to share with you some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. If you and I were sitting at a table just like this, there'd be three things I'd want to share with you. We all have highs and lows. Every day is getting better and how dangerous it is to cling. I can remember this one story I told my family at the table one time that still makes me laugh to this day. If you're anything like me, then some of the funniest stuff that you've ever been a part of have happened, has happened because of the most random, spur-of-the-moment spur stuff you just walked right into. And that's been pretty much true for me my whole life. But I'll explain. We all dream about it. We either have it or we're studying to get it. And it's the first step into the world of freedom and adventure that we can really take in. That's right, getting our driver's license. Does anyone here have their driver's license? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? <laughs> getting my driver's license was one of the biggest accomplishments from my life right next to finding out that coffee goes great with ice cream and being born. I can still remember it on a cold February morning. I jumped out of bed, I hopped right into my 2004 Red Jeep Wrangler that I'd just gotten like a couple days ago. And I drove myself to school without any help for the very first time, me and myself driving to school. I pulled into my student parking lot and drove right past the students that still had to be dropped off by their parents to get to school. <laughs> I bet they were telling their mom or dad that they had done their homework or what time they had to be picked up from practice after school. But not this guy. I 
parked myself in the student parking lot and strutted into that school like, why, yes, that is my Jeep, ladies. Mm. <laughs> so I'm feeling all this confidence, right? I walk to my first class, Ag Mechanics. By the way, I should mention, I was taking Ag Mechanics just because I wanted to keep Ag in my class schedule and not because I have any talent for Ag Mechanics whatsoever. Just to clarify. So I walk into Ag Mechanics, and immediately waiting on the other side of the room when I take a step in the door is a group of the Ag Mech guys that know what they're doing in that class. Second I step in, they're like, hey, Mitch, is that your Jeep out there? And with a big old grin, I go, it sure is. And the guys were impressed. I could tell. They said, well, shoot, is that thing four-wheel drive? And that's when I said, nope, automatic. <laughs> Some of you all may be laughing right now because you know how hilariously dumb that sounds. And some of you have no idea what's so funny. <laughs> and that's exactly how I felt at the time. My first day of freedom suddenly took like a hard right turn to humiliation. From that point on, I was known as the boy in that mechanics who didn't know his triple carburetor compressor from his flux capacitor. I mean, am I right? Stupid. That was embarrassing. And after the laugh ended, I learned that people are mean. Their jokes got harsh. And from that point on, I was a misfit in that class. My day of feeling on top of the world suddenly came crashing down like that. The odds are great that we've all said something as embarrassing as that once or twice in our lives. Some of us let that moment drag us down into the gutter, like me. When we think about it, we can classify our life as either going good, bad, or a state that can really only be best described as meh. You know what I'm saying? Some of y'all are on top of the world right now. You just nailed that test last week. You are having an amazing day because that cute girl you've been thinking about, y'all are texting every day now. But y'all, if I've learned anything, there is always a flip side to that. Some of us are going through some really tough stuff right now. Some of us are freshmen here, and this new life in high school just isn't the party that everyone described it would be. Some of us were trusted to make that game win shot. We, made a, made a, we might have made a three-pointer one day, but the next day we were trusted to make that shot, and we missed it. Some of us probably just got out of a relationship here that they're really not over yet. However you would define the day that you're living right now, good, bad, or meh, I can tell you, you are exactly where you need to be. I genuinely believe that every single moment is meant to teach us and to shape us and grow us. Like for instance, that moment in that mechanics was meant to teach me that when I'm full of ugly pride, I can say some really dumb stuff. So live your life. Look for the lessons. Observe it, make adjustments, and walk on. We need the good and the bad to lead us to where we're meant to be. Think about it. How would you describe your day, and what can you learn from where you are right now? Either way, it's cool you're there. Y'all, if times are good, embrace it. Because trust me when I say that it's temporary. If times are bad, just keep on going. Because trust me when I say it's temporary. We need the good days and the bad days to get us to where we're meant to be. Love where you are. If it's true that we need the good days and the bad days to get us to where we're meant to be, then we can't cling to any of them. Now, don't get me wrong. Clinging is not the same thing as valuing our relationships. And it's definitely not the same thing as being thankful for all that we've been given. When we cling, 
we try to preserve a moment that was never meant to be preserved. Think about it. We all know that one guy or girl that's still stuck in 1992 back when he or she led the team to the high school state championships and will tell you every detail. We all know that guy or girl. That's clinging. When we let memories consume us. Sometimes when we win, we just want life to freeze right there. Winning feels good. Why would we ever want to move on with our lives when we could just talk about that time we won? But if I've learned anything, it's that that's not the way we're meant to live. That's the same as giving up after one defeat, or even worse, before we've given our all. When we can't let go of what's already happened, we lose the ability to get ready for future victories. Y'all, there are other dreams to dream. There are other wins that if we really want, we got to straight up chase to get there. Saying that we're satisfied when really we're scared to see what would happen if we took a step outside to take another step is not an option. One loss should not be enough to stop you, and one win should not be enough to satisfy you. But let's break this down real quick. We can think of life as light. If we hold open our hands, just like this, palms up, fingers outstretched, we can literally see light, our life, passing through our fingers. Every victory, every disappointment, every moment that we've ever experienced is literally in the palm of our hands right now. Y'all, in life, there are going to be some great days. We'll nail that CDE that we worked so hard for. We will convince the hottest hottie in the whole class school to be obey. <laughs> or maybe we're just having a cool hair day. Those days are going to come, and when they do, it's completely natural for us to want to cling on to that moment as hard as we can. But there is always a flip side to it. Some of us are going through some really tough stuff right now. Some of us have some things going on right now, like they think that the folks that they've been spending time around with just decide that you're not really their friend, so they stop talking to you. Some people here have a rough family life. Some people here may look in the mirror and they don't like what we see. It's still natural for us to cling on to that moment, but here we're clinging on to the idea that we're not good enough for friends or family or confidence. We tell ourselves a lie, and then we believe that lie, cling to that lie to protect ourselves from getting hurt. But really what we're doing is clinging to a false sense of security. I mean, look at what we've done. No light can pass through these hands. Life has not stopped shining. We just choose to receive less of it. Y'all, when, when we lose the ability to let things that happened way in the past still bother us, then we can't move on with our life. We have to let go of the good and the bad so that we can receive this moment. Love where you've been, but don't cling to it. Let's take a look at one more story that I learned at the table that taught me just what can happen when we don't cling. My brother Nick is a great football player, middle linebacker to be precise. On the field, Nick had the reputation of being fearless. He played hard and he tackled hard regardless of the size of his opponent. I can remember this one game in particular where Nick was going in for the tackle as hard as he possibly can. And honestly, as big as the other dude was, he bounced off the guy like a racquetball and crashed to the ground like a cinder block. And he lay there, he lay there still. And that's when we heard from the press box where I was sitting, him screaming and shouting in pain. My brother had to be helped up, Nick had to be put into a car and driven immediately to the emergency room. Later that night, we found out that both bones right below his left elbow were snapped in two. 
Still got the scar today. An overnight surgery, two rods and 13 screws later meant that my brother's football season was over. And Nick was devastated. Football was his passion. He had been playing with his teammates since the third grade. That night, and for the weeks that followed, I watched my brother experience the lowest and saddest time in his entire life. And if you know Nick, you know that Nick doesn't do sad very often. It was awful. Now, if you may think this weird, but I think it is awesome that my brother broke his arm. I'm so happy it happened. And I know I'm a terrible person, but let me explain. Nick broke his arm his freshman year of high school, about the same time that he was deciding that this FFA thing just wasn't for him. While his brother, me, was doing the FFA thing, he was going to invest all his energies into his passion, football. With his dreams for the season literally crushed, literally, he had a lot of free time on his hands. And so he decided, with some extra free time, they'd tag along with me to his first and probably last national convention in Indianapolis. With a bar jacket and low expectations, he walked into that national convention hall and he saw the energy, and he felt the excitement of our nation's amazing FFA members. Yeah, it is amazing. And from then on, my brother knew that he had a new passion, football. And FFA. FFA, really. Those three days changed his life. And from then on, my brother knew he belonged in both things, our organization, and the game that he loved. Now, when Nick was able to finally get his arm healed, he went back to his football team. He started every game as middle linebacker, and because of his leadership, he led the defense to the team's first undefeated season in more than 60 years. Yeah. His leadership on defense was key, and his influence on people ignited others. But Nick, wasn't done with FFA when he could start playing football again. After all of those three days, did change his life. Nick went on to be a chapter officer. He competed in CDEs. And this morning, he's sitting in the crowd as a state secretary for the Tennessee FFA Association. <laughs> and no one could be prouder of him than me, his big brother. Y'all, here's what I've learned. Every moment in our lives is preparing us for something bigger and better. Nick did not realize it at the time, but as he sits here today, he understands. If my brother hadn't have broken his arm, he likely would not have experienced all the amazing things that FFA has to offer. He probably wouldn't be here as a state officer either. Y'all, we have to have faith that our best days are yet to come, and that the experiences we're going through right now are preparing us for something bigger and better tomorrow. When I think about it, the happiest days of my life have happened because of this organization. But as awesome as this is, I have faith that my best days haven't happened yet. Please understand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about a cotton candy, no pain ever future when I say that our best days are yet to come. Here pretty soon, the people sitting at my table won't be with me any longer. Chairs will go empty. And it really won't be that long until I have to walk away from this table that I've spent my entire life sitting around laughing and loving other people. But that's okay. It really is, because here pretty soon, I'm going to be at a new table. Maybe you know, I'll have some really cool friends sitting there with me. Maybe I'll have my wife and our kids sitting there with me. Either way, I have faith that it's going to be better than where I am right now, just different. There will be tough days. But our lives are waves. Why would we let that wave crash when we graduate from high school? 
or when we have to hang up the FFA jacket, or when we win something, or when we lose something. We have to let those events make our wave stronger. And we have to make that wave make us stronger and have hope. Because, y'all, the dreams that we can dream, the plans that have been made for us, are bigger than we could ever imagine. For the longest time, I had no idea what I was supposed to share here on this stage. I lost a lot of sleep, and I wandered around random parking lots, and I ate way too much midnight Taco Bell. <laughs> Hoping that somehow like the RA message would be on like a hot sauce packet, like, hey, you're gonna talk about life, or whatever. I realize now that I haven't shared profound stories here today. It's a simple truth that we all have highs and lows, and, and we can't cling to any of them, all because we're in a better pursuit for a better tomorrow than we're having today. Instead, I'm here to share with you the best truth I've ever learned at the table. And it really is that simple. Love where you are. Love where you've been. And love where you're going. Because there's a lot of life left to live. Mitchell Wade, <laughs> there are no limits to the enthusiasm and charisma you bring to every situation, turning everyday events into a electric dance parties to get the whole team energized. Your Abercrombie and Fitch-esque skin tone and jawline are surface level features we envy. But underneath, we know you as a man grounded in his faith and one that shows true compassion and acceptance for others. You go all out every day we're proud to call you our brother. You have slept an average of three hours a night and danced your way through this year, <laughs> always setting the bar of selflessness higher for us and everyone else around you. Thanks for being our brother. Love all out, Jackson, Brian, Stephen, Wes, and Jason. National FFA, your national FFA secretary, Mitch Baker.